I'm Mike Miller. I really appreciate all the people supporting the show and checking out the guests that I bring on here. I've been bringing on creative people for the last couple of years and there are a lot of creative people in the Denton area. I'm really glad to have Stephen Gent here today. He's a printmaker, musician, and very talented man, former software developer. And thank you, Stephen, for being here. My pleasure, Mike. So has this been a pretty good week for you? Uh, not too bad. Uh, one highlight, I guess you could say, is I just started working on a, a mandolin kit that I'm putting together. Oh, really? So that's fun. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You've been coming around to the open mics quite a while now. Yeah, I uh, started at Banter when Banter, when Banter was still around. Yeah. Uh, uh, I've been to uh, Bearded Monk, but Be uh, th that one turned out to be almost exclusively for uh, stand-up comedy, so I, I only went there one time because I was the only musician there. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yes. And the Abbey Underground, you used to come there and yes. play, yeah. Yeah. Age there. Right. Now I mostly go to Killer's Tacos. Yeah. And Armadillo Ale Works. Mm-hmm. Right. That's a nice room. It is. Both of those places, mm -hmm. yeah. Caleb does a great job over at Killer's and. Uh, Caleb, Caleb is the best. Yeah. And Matt Grigsby does a good job over there at the mm -hmm. uh, second place you mentioned, right. Amarillo. Armadillo. Armadillo, yeah. It works, yes. Yeah. I've been there one night. I enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. So, did you play guitar as a kid? I started playing guitar in high school. Uh, I was one of the millions of kids who was in a garage band. Yeah. Uh, we stayed in the garage. We never made it out. <laughs> did y'all play rock music? Yes. Yeah. Uh, at that time, we weren't writing original stuff. We were just playing just having fun getting together and playing songs we liked. Yeah, fun songs, fun mm -hmm. cover songs. Right. It's good to see if you can do them or what your version sounds like, you know. I don't think I'd want to hear them now. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, we did make a few recordings and uh, it may be a blessing that they are so low in fidelity so that you don't really <laughs> hear what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> what did you major in in college? Uh, well, my de degree at Rice back in 73 was in history, but I majored in oh, three or four other things before I finally really? lit on history. I, I entered as a math major, Oh. Uh, and that only took one semester to prove to myself that I was not a mathematician. I couldn't I'd, do I'd, that. I'd, I'd aced all the honors math courses in high school. Really? So I thought, well, I, you know, I can do this. Yeah. But uh, uh, one college level uh, analysis course was uh, my downfall as a mathematician. I you might have just had a bad teacher. I, oh no, he was fine. He, it, it was uh, just it was over my head a lot. Of, I was proud of the C I got in that course. Yeah. That that C was not easily obtained. Some of those classes are really tough. That one was tough enough for me. And then you ended up working for a big company and became a software developer. Yes, I worked for, at the time anyway, the big company, which yeah. was IBM. Right. Uh, th that was a strange set of circumstances because, like I say, I had a, a bachelor's degree in history. So you wouldn't think that that would be a, a, an obvious entree into IBM. But that was back when uh, there really wasn't such a thing in uh, universities as a computer science department. The computer work was going on in either the electrical engineering department or the math department. That's, mm -hmm. that's where people were working with computers. So you didn't have people running around with a computer science degree. Yeah, and nobody had a PC. Right. Uh, computers were, well, like they would fill Mainframe. this room, basically. Yeah. Uh, so no, no, nobody had their own computer. But uh, because there weren't a lot of people running around with computer talent and computer experience, IBM would hire uh, people who had a degree in something mm -hmm. as, as a credential that you, you had the discipline to get a degree. You, you could yeah. study and learn and, and, and concentrate on something. Uh, 
Uh, and then uh, they also had this thing they called the data processing aptitude test, which was a lot like a uh, SAT kind of a thing. Yeah. Different, different kinds of questions, but the same style. Mm -hmm. And if you did well on that, then they would give you a shot. Uh, they would send you to several months of computer training. And by the time you came out, you knew as about as, as much as most of the uh, people that you would be, uh, not IBM people, but most of the customers that you'd be working with, you knew as much as they did. So I'm sure. you could, you could uh, coach them. Uh, so Where did you work back then? I started at IBM in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Hmm. Uh, I was there for a little over five years. Then I was in Atlanta for another five or so years. Mm -hmm. Then Houston, and then up to the Dallas area. Oh, I and see. And that's where I've been ever since. Yeah. Uh, so I, I left IBM in 98. So I've been on my own for 20, well, pretty close to 21 years. Yeah. Now. And you started taking classes at UNT in composition and orchestration. Right. Well, that was actually the the principal reason that I left IBM. I, I was not there long enough to be eligible for the full pension package and all the benefits. Uh, I'd been there 21 years, and I needed to be there at least 25. Yeah. Uh, partly for the the, the uh, seniority, and, and partly for uh, to be a, an age that would qualify you to retire as well. But you just couldn't take it those last four years? Well, it, it wasn't that I couldn't take IBM anymore, although uh, IBM had certainly changed from when I started there. I'm sure. But uh, there were also other things that I just wanted to uh, spend time involved in, uh, uh, writing music, uh, writing uh, books, uh, writing prose, uh, something artistic, and I just knew that as long as I was working for IBM, I would never have the time and the energy to do those things. Yeah. I would either have the time but be so burned out that I didn't care, yeah. or I would have the energy but not the time. So I just said, I, I don't want to put these things off anymore. So I, I didn't, strictly speaking, retire, I quit. And so now uh, I, I have been able to work on some of those things. That's good. I, I've never been sorry. I just decided, uh, I would accept a less extravagant retired lifestyle uh, in exchange for getting to do these things that were really important to me, and I've, I've never regretted it. And you started writing at about that time, putting putting things together to, that ultimately became some of these books that you published? Right. Uh, I joined a writer's workshop oh, uh -huh. uh, down in the Mid-Cities mm -hmm. area, uh, and they had a really good system. Uh, it wasn't just the kind of uh, writers get together where you take turns reading and take turns telling each other how great you are, because you aren't going to learn no. from that. Uh, instead of mutual congratulations, it was mutual critique, where uh, you would read for a while and then you couldn't say anything while people would tell you what they liked and what they didn't like. You couldn't respond because oh. that was just going to waste time. Yeah. You, you weren't there to defend yeah. what you'd written. You were there to, to it, hear other people yeah. give you advice. So that, uh, that system uh, was quite effective. They had lots and lots of people in print. It, it had worked very well for them. And uh, one of the people in the workshop was actually the acquisitions editor for a regional Texas imprint. Oh, really? Called, uh, uh, well, what is it? <laughs> I forgot what it's called. Oh, uh, Republic of Texas Press. How could I forget that? Uh, and I always have to explain that they were not at all affiliated with the, the crazies that wanted to de declare a new Republic of Texas. <laughs> they, they wanted to break away from the United States. It, it had nothing to do with that. They just picked that name because it was a historical kind yeah. of an association. Uh, but she was the acquisitions editor for this uh, publisher, and so we talked sometimes about uh, what would be a good thing for me to write because they published Texas nonfiction. Oh, uh huh. Basically, anything but 
novels. It, it could be history, travel, cooking, touring, just anything about Texas except fiction. Mm -hmm. And so uh, what uh, the, the first book I wrote for her was the Browser's Book of Texas History, which is, uh, if you're familiar with the concept of a book of days. I've it, heard of that. It, well, it, it's a book that has <coughs> some sort of an entry for each day of the calendar year. Oh, not yeah. Not a particular year, just from January 1st to December 31st. Oh. Not associated with any given year, like not saying January 1st, Wednesday, but just January 1st. Uh, and for each of those days, there will be some entry with a common theme. Uh, you could have a literary book of days or a uh, gardening book of days. There are all kinds of formats that. that I used to have that uh, Seven Habits calendar. Mm -hmm. The guy who wrote that Seven Habits of Successful People. Right. And there was like a different thought for each day, mm -hmm. you know. Right. Uh, but that sounds like it was a calendar for a given year. It was, right. Yeah. So that, that wouldn't be a big book of days, but it's the same idea. Yeah. Uh, so a book of days is something that doesn't expire at the end of a year. Uh, so Ever. in my case, my uh, browser's book of Texas history is a book of days for Texas history. Uh, it tells you two or three things that happened on that day oh in yeah. some year. Yeah. And it goes back as far as the uh, Spanish colonial period and goes all the way up through uh, what was current, at least at the time I wrote the book. So the, the book's 20 years old, so there, there are things that aren't in it that you might expect. Uh, but you they brought that book They hadn't today. happened yet, so yeah. I couldn't write about them. One of these is that book. Yes, this is the Browser's Book of Texas History. Show it to the people. <laughs> How long did you work on this? Oh, about a year, I guess. Really? Yeah. That's pretty good. Uh, and what I concentrated on was things that people probably hadn't heard of before. Really? Even if you've lived in Texas all your life, there are, yeah. there are things that happened in this state that uh, uh, you probably didn't know about. And so I, I, there are a few things that you can't leave out because the book just won't be complete. You went to the libraries and did a lot of research on various things? Uh, one of the most interesting resources I found was county histories. Oh. Basically every county in Texas, someone, maybe with the County Historical Society, mm -hmm. has written a history of their county. and. That's where you find a lot of these obscure things that don't make them, they don't make their way into the Texas history books. Yeah. Uh, you're not going to read about them in a uh, Texas history course, but uh, one way or another, they illuminate the whole character of, of Texas, which is pretty unique as far as I can tell. Yeah. And then the sequel to that, uh, because it was such a huge bestseller, not really, uh, but I was looking for another thing to write. and. Uh, uh, sh my editor and I both liked the idea of staying with some sort of Texas uh, historical theme. So the follow-on book was called The Browser's Book of Texas Quotations. Oh. And I always have to explain that it's not how to talk like a Texan, because that's been done. I mean, there there are books that uh, teach you all of the, Chris the characteristic Texas <laughs> ways of speaking. So it, it's not how to talk like a Texan. It's what have people uh, said in or about Texas? Mm -hmm. And again, it, go it goes back hundreds of years. Uh, uh, you've got quotes from uh, early Spanish and French colonists, ag again, coming all the way up through the 20th century. And was Texas part of the Louisiana Purchase? Parts of Texas? Um, I don't believe so, because it was Spanish, it wasn't French. Oh, okay, Louisiana Purchase just went through Arkansas and some of those states, I think. Right, right, yeah. Louisiana, Louisiana, Arkansas, Missouri, and then... Oh, Valley. yeah. But no, Texas was Spanish at the time, so it, it was not part of the Louisiana Purchase. Texas and then, after a while, it was no longer Spanish, it was Mexican. And then, in 1836, it was no longer Mexican. It, and it's interesting that uh, Texas is the only state that has joined the Union on a sort of a peer basis because Texas was its own nation for 10 years. Really? So it wasn't like uh, any of the other states that were gradually absorbed into the United States uh, in Western expansion. Uh, they were basically absorbed from the Indians. 
but Texas was an independent nation. It had its own army, navy, uh, diplomatic service, legislature, uh, president, Sam Houston. Uh, and uh, they got by for 10 years and were going deeper and deeper in debt, mm. uh, which was another national institution that they were able to take part in, was, was being uh, way in the red. And the uh, United States w had long been interested in acquiring Texas, and finally the uh, uh, Texan, uh, Texas uh, politician said, uh, we'll do that if you will absorb our debt. And so that was one of the terms of the uh, annexation was uh, all, everything, uh, everybody that Texas owes money to, the United States will pay. Hmm. And the United States had the money to do so, I guess. Uh, Texas did not, so <laughs> it What years all right. was that? 1846. Oh, okay. Yeah. Hmm. yeah, so it was 10 years, from 1836 to 1846. Hmm. And that is the, interesting. And there's, a, there's a, a myth that another one of the terms of annexation was that any time it wants to, Texas can secede. Oh, really? Uh, th there are people who believe that. Oh, yeah. They think that one of the, since we were an independent nation and we joined the United States, we have the privilege of becoming an independent nation again. That, that was one of the terms of annexation, but it wasn't. Oh. There was a very interesting uh, provision in annexation uh, in, in the, the treaty, which was that uh, any time it wants to, Texas can split into four states. Really? It's either four states or is it four additional states? Maybe it's five altogether. I, I, I don't remember exactly now. But uh, if it wanted to, Texas could have eight senators. Hmm. And who knows how many congressmen. Yeah. Do you think they'll ever do that? No. Yeah. But uh, uh, just, just imagine uh, if Texas had almost a tenth of the senators in the United States. <laughs> uh, like North Texas might be one state. Right, right. Uh, now, would they be able to uh, cooperate with each other to exert that power, or would they just become squabbling states like everybody else and, yeah. and throw it away? Who knows? Who knows, yeah. I don't think we'll ever find out. But uh, that's probably the root of that myth, is that uh, uh, Texas could, at will, uh, divide into multiple states, and I guess somehow that got uh, morphed in the ima public imagination into Texas could become independent again. But uh, that, that is not true. And that's what that Republic of Texas movement thought they were going to do, but uh, it, it was not going to work out. Yeah. And then you got into more like um, the work you did with Keats. Oh, Keats and Chapman. That, that's yeah. That that's a, a very different book. Now that one actually is self-published. Uh, I I didn't even try to find someone who would publish that because it's it's too too idiosyncratic. I think. But uh, have you ever heard of? Uh, there was a an Irish author named Miles Nagopoline. Ever encountered him before? I've heard of. Keats and Chapman, Ch Keats watching, it, looking at Chapman's Homer on the, what was it, the urn or something? Oh, right. Uh, uh, that's, that's one of Keats' most famous poems, Ode to a Grecian Urn. Right? Ode to a Grecian right. Urn, yeah. Beauty is truth, truth, beauty, that is all you know on earth and all you need to know. That's exactly it. Uh, but Miles Nagopoulin, who wrote uh, 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 under that name, his real name was Brian O'Nolan. I, I couldn't remember, so I had to look it up. Oh, and he was a 20th century person. Yes. Okay. Uh, he was <coughs> active in the 30s and 40s and 50s. Uh, he was a, a very, very funny writer. He, he uh, lived in Dublin and, and published his short pieces in whatever the Dublin newspaper is. Mm -hmm. And some of the little humorous bits that he would write were about these two characters named Keats and Chapman. And I'm sure he took that name from the, the Keats poem that mentioned the English poet Chapman. Yeah. Uh, so he just picked those two names, and they're, they're like schoolfellows. And 
Uh, one of them, the, the stories about Keats and Chapman are always uh, finished with a horrible, horrible pun. Uh, like, uh, th there's a character named Francois Huel who has a, a very valuable painting and he, he, he loses it in, uh, in a ridiculous manner and, and Chapman says, F. Huel and his Monet are soon parted. <laughs> 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 They're all that bad, and I. I and I that's love a line from one of Keats. Uh, no, it's just the proverb: "A fool and his money are soon parted." It's, it's, oh, I see. Yeah, it's a. It's just a terrible play on words. And Chapman had actually lived about 150 years before Keats. Yes, Chapman was an Elizabethan. Elizabethan, yeah. Poet. And Keats was a Romantic poet, so yeah, about 150 years apart, more or less. Uh, so they have nothing in common as far as style, but but he just came up with these two characters, Keats and Chapman, and and I guess he just liked the the, the tie into the names. And uh, uh, he died in the 50s or 60s. I, uh, I forget exactly when. And I just. Uh, liked the Keats and Chapman stories so much that I thought someone should keep writing them. So I took it on myself to write, was it 150? Yeah, 150 new Keats and Chapman stories. Each one ending with a horrible, horrible pun. That's pretty good. <laughs> Some of them are better than others. Some of them I'm, I'm very pleased with. Others were just, I, I needed to force something in there, but uh, most of them are pretty good. And Keats was very prolific. He had released a lot of material, and by the time he was, what, he died at 24 or something like that? 20-something, yeah. He, he was very young, died of uh, the, the, the romantic disease, tuberculosis. Tuberculosis. What they called consumption. Yeah. But if you're going to die as a poet, that's the way you want to go. Uh, although, uh, Byron died fighting for Greek liberty, so yeah. I guess that's romantic enough, too. Fever out in the fields or whatever. Right, right. right. Uh, Shelley just drowned, which isn't very, uh, not very romantic. But <laughs> what are you going to do? Got caught in a storm. What, in the Mediterranean Sea? I believe so. Yeah. Yes. It, it, it was on the Italian coast, anyway. I, I think that's right. And Keats had gone to his funeral. Or, or did, he, did Keats die after him or before? Uh, Keats died first, because first. Shelley, Shelley wrote Adonais to him. Yeah, the right. tribute to him. Right. There's something about Keats released something and he got some bad reviews and then his health went down or something. I don't remember that. And he went that on, could be. He went on an adventure and, and was out in the weather so much that it um, it affected his tuberculosis, I uh, guess. That's plausible. I, I don't know the story. Yeah. But I, I would believe it. But yes, he, he died very young. That's true. They had the major five romantic poets at that time, I think, like uh, Brian, Keats, Shelley, like you, what you were saying, but... Um, oh, who else? Uh, was Wordsworth around by then? I, I don't remember. I don't know, yeah. He was later, I think. Hmm. Maybe he was one. Wordsworth and Coleridge. I just right. can't remember there. Right. Well, Wordsworth lived a long time. He lived to be about 80, whereas they didn't. <coughs> Lord right. Byron died at, what, about 36 or something like that? Yeah. Right. Yeah. But uh, he put in a pretty full life. By the time yeah, he, uh, he got around. Yeah, he did. And this is your um, quotations book, right? That was the sequel to the sequel to the, the, his, the Texas the history. Texas history. Yeah. Uh, like I said, it, it's things that people have said, either things that Texans have said that are some way uh, enlightening about uh, Texas history, or in some cases, it's what people from outside of Texas have said about it. Sometimes complimentary, sometimes not so much. Yeah. Uh, but always uh, colorful. Mm -hmm. So you like art and drawing and you um, went into printmaking and drew these railroad um, trusses? The, well, they weren't railroad bridges, they were road bridges. Road bridges. Yeah, they were, they were uh, just... Uh, for cars to go uh, over. Well, originally they would have been built for wagons. Wagons. Because right. yeah. uh, they were all one lane. One lane, yeah. Uh, they were built strong enough that, that they could carry auto traffic when it came around, but uh, they were built in the 1870s, 1880s, uh, and 
most of them are not in their original location anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, but the good news is they haven't been just torn apart and melted down. Uh, they've just uh, generally been moved to uh, a park or some pub public area where people can still View look them. at them and maybe learn something about Texas history from them. Yeah. Uh, one of them is on the campus of Geyer High School. One of your um, prints. No, one of the bridges. One of the bridges. Was moved to Geyer High School. Oh, the actual bridge is at that yeah. high school. I, right. I they, didn't know. Uh, the way they would move them, they would lift it up, put a wheel on each corner and tow it. Really? Yeah. Mm. Uh, I'm sure it was uh, really tough on traffic when they did that. Yeah. They, they were you know, fairly good sized things. Pretty big, yeah. But again, they were just one lane wide, so they, they wouldn't be uh, uh, as wide as, say, a house, which they can be moved sometimes. But yeah. Uh, and the old Alton Bridge, is that the one associated with the ghost? Yes, that's uh, the old Alton or Copper Canyon Bridge. It, it is still in its original location. Oh, really? There, there's a replacement bridge just parallel to it. Oh. And that is now the, the automobile bridge. Oh, yeah. So you drive o over that bridge and you can look over and see the old Alton Bridge. It's now basically a footpath. Mm -hmm. And there's another one that is still in its original site. That's the one that is uh, just next to Sherman Drive. Uh, if you're headed out toward Aubrey. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, if you're going east or north on Sherman Drive, it'll be on your left. Hmm. About halfway from here to Aubrey. It'll, oh, really? I think I have seen that. Yeah. And again, you drive on the new bridge, but mm -hmm. the old bridge is right next to it. And yeah. it, again, is, is a footpath. There's a, a long park that goes along the Trinity River. Oh, really? Yeah. One, one branch or another of the Trinity River. Yeah. And uh, there's a footpath that just goes along the banks there, and that bridge is part of it. So the, uh, it, it's nice that the, uh, at least the bridges are being preserved. Yeah. Uh, you, but uh, the, the prints that I made of them uh, were when they were still but for the most part, in their original location. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Sometimes they had already been moved, like the one that's on Geyer High School. I forget where it was. Uh, but I tried to uh, recreate what it would have looked like in situ when, when it was originally built. Did you go out there and make photographs of it and then tr draw from yep. that? Yeah. Yep. Uh, which involved climbing up and down the banks, sometimes through uh, blackberry briars <laughs> and all kinds and of things. God. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, you, you want to uh, take photographs of it from a variety of angles, angles yeah. and then you come back and, and look at the photos and decide which aspect yeah. is, is the best composition for, a, for an artwork. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you start from there to make a plate and, and create a print from it. Did you start with like pencil etchings at first, or, or what is this plate process? How does that work? Well, to make a print, uh, there are there are two principal techniques in printmaking. Uh, one is called intaglio, and the other is relief. Uh, intaglio says that you you make grooves in a flat metal plate, and then you wipe ink on the plate, uh, which remains behind in the grooves. So that that's that's your your image, yeah. and then you press that against a piece of paper, and the ink transfers to the paper, and, and there you've got your print. Oh, so really? that's called intaglio. It, it tell you is some it's Italian word that means something like scratching. Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> whereas relief says that uh, you carve away the part that you don't want to print, like a wood block. Oh. Where the part that is left behind is where the ink is applied and then you apply that to a piece of paper and it, you, you get a print. Yeah. So those are the, the two schools of, of uh, printmaking. And, and there's, of course, there's, there's also lithography and, and silk, silk screen, so it's not just those two. There are lots of other techniques too. Uh, but I was using uh, uh, intaglio plates to, because uh, one thing I liked about that process in particular is I like a plate mark where the 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 edges of the plate leave a, a depression in the paper. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you can see, well, this really came from a plate. It, it, it didn't come from an inkjet printer. Yeah. <laughs> it came from a press. So I, I just like that 
uh, uh, realness about that, it. I like that look. I like that appearance. It just seems more authentic to me. Yeah. And the, the lithographers out there and, and woodblock people are going to say, well, there's nothing inauthentic about what we do. It's just that that's, that was my, my taste in prints. And I, I like sure, a, a plate yeah. mark. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you sharing all these things with us. And uh, I find that very interesting. And appreciate you coming down to the studio today. And My uh, pleasure. And thank you guys so much for watching. And we really appreciate it. And have a great day.